Now let's see. Uh, let's now discuss the transfer matrices for uh, a thin film. And we'll specialize to uh, normal incidence. Uh, this, is, this lecture is more intended as a proof of the concept or the principle. And then if you want the details with uh, a finite angle of incidence and so on, you can go to the, to the compendium and read the details. But um, I think the transfer matrix is, is an important technique to know, uh, to know about. So I will um, get an example of what you can use that for now. So the geometry we'll consider is as follows. Uh, so we have, let's see x3 axis in the direction of the propagation and x1 in this direction. This is air. So I uh, rotated the film 90 degrees. This is the film. And this is a substrate. And note that at normal incidence, S and P polarization is the same, right? Because um, well, now if the E field is like this, well, I could just rotate the film 90 degrees, and we'll be back to the same thing. So we have some K naught here, and uh, E naught vector here coming into the film. Reflected, we have a field E naught prime, and uh, going also upwards, and K naught prime like that. Inside the film, we're going to have fields traveling both in this direction and in this direction. So uh, if I sketch those, it's K1 going in this direction and E1. That's the electric field of the field going in this direction. Always considering plane waves here. And K0, nay, K1 prime, that's the reflected wave vector, and E1 prime, that's the reflected electric field inside the film. In the substrate, there's nothing to give a reflection, because we assume that the substrate goes to infinity, meaning that in the substrate, we only have K2 and E2. So the numbering is 0, 1, 2, like before. OK. Now, the most important thing in life is, as always, the boundary conditions. That is, if you're a physicist, at least. So E parallel and H parallel is continuous. Those are the boundary conditions. Because in, uh, with normal incidence, there is no um, E or B field vertical to the, to the interface. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what those boundary conditions are. Um, here you note that k cross e, that gives us an H field out of the board here. And here it gives us, let's say, k cross e into the board here. OK, so because of the reflection, the H has to flip side or direction. Yeah, we're going to require that it continues. The point is that the sum of this field plus this field is going to be equal to the sum of this field plus this field at the interface. But that's good. The B field, is it the B field is the kind of flip face? Uh, yeah, the but the sum of, it's the sum of all the fields in this region and the sum of all these fields in this region that are continuous. And there's one, uh, let's say, flipped field here and here. And there's one unflipped here and here. So the sum should be continuous, OK? So I think that should take care of it. Uh, also, just to remind you, in vacuum, we have that H is given as 1 over Z0 K hat cross E. And in uh, a medium, or a, that is a dielectric medium, where uh, N is equal to square root of epsilon R, then we have that H is equal to N over Z0 k hat cross e, like that. All right. Now, what does the continuity of e and uh, h mean? Well, it means that e naught plus e naught prime is equal to e1 
plus e1 prime at the interface, right? So um, write that here at interface. So that's this interface between 0 and 1 here. Let's call that equation 1. In a similar fashion, the ages on each side are similar. So age not minus age not prime, because the age flips, right? Is equal to age 1 minus age 1 prime. And uh, if we use this formula here, I can restate this as, uh, let's see, n0 e0 minus e0 prime is equal to n1 e1 minus e1 prime. Because h is simply, in magnitude, is simply n times e. This is length 1. And uh, while the set naught is a numerical factor, but it's the same on both sides of this equation. So uh, I can write it without the set. This gives us equation 2. Um, and at the second interface, we're going to have exactly the same boundary conditions, except now uh, we're going to have an extra phase in the field, because the, the field has been uh, tra transferred at distance d. d is the thickness of the film still. So. Um, at second interface, or at the 1, 2 interface, we have an extra phase, which is e to i k1 d, which is the thickness of the film. OK? This is the wave number inside the, the film. Um, right. And this gives us two new equations, which are e1, e to i k1 d. Now e1 here, by the way, is the field at the interface. OK? So e0 and e1, those are the fields here. While the fields um, at the second interface, that's e1, e to i k1 d, and so on. So the equation reads e1, e to i k1 d plus e 1 prime e to minus i k d, because it has to propagate backwards in time, right? Since it's coming in the other direction, that should be equal to e2. There's only one field going out into the substrate, because there's nothing to reflect off from. So maybe I should call that equation 3, but I didn't in the notes. No, not yet. So n1, e1, e to i, k1, d, minus n1, e1 prime, e to i, k1, d, is equal to n2, e2. That's the equivalent of this equation at the second interface. So the question is, why doesn't e2 have an e to i, k, blah, blah, blah? And the answer is that I'm interested in finding e2 in terms of e1, uh, sorry, e0. Okay, so I want to eliminate all the fields inside here. I'm not really interested in what happens inside the film. I'm more interested in if I shine light on this film, what comes back out and what goes through. Okay? So uh, I defined e1 to be the electric field at this interface, just on this side. e0 is the field at the same interface, just on the other side. And E2 is the field just to the right of this interface. OK? So I relate this field to the field here by this E to I, K, 1, D. Better? OK? Let's see. Now I can rearrange these two equations using that E to I, K, 1, D is equal to a cosine plus I sine of K, D. This gives me equation 3 which reads E1 plus E1 prime. That's the total field at the first interface, just on the inside of the film, times cosine of K1 D. That's the first term in each of these exponentials, the cosine. Uh, and then plus E1 
minus e one prime i sine of k one d is equal to e two. So that's this equation here, rearranging where I put the sines and the cosines, or expanding the exponential if you want. <laughs> equation four, I do the same th procedure to this uh, h parallel equation, giving me n one e one minus e one prime cosine of k d plus n one e one plus e one prime i sine of k d is equal to n two e two. Okay, so I rearrange those equations in this fashion. And now, as I said, I wanted to eliminate the fields inside the film. And uh, if you have a look here and here, you'll see that uh, the fields in equation one and equation two, those are the sum and difference e1 plus e1 prime and e1 minus e1 prime. And those are the unknowns in this equation system. So I can solve for this unknown and this unknown and uh, insert those solutions into these equations because then I have equations relating e0 to e2 and that's exactly what I want. Okay? So now I solve these equations here to find um, an expression for e1 minus e1 prime and same for the plus. Insert into here and then we should be good. So um, let's see. I'll just uh, quote the result because this is simple uh, linear algebra. Um, perhaps starting here. So, we solve 3 and 4 for a1 plus e1 prime, e1 minus e1 prime. And then we get these equations relating uh, e0 and e2. So hold your breath, 1 plus e0 prime over e0 is equal to cosine of k1 d uh, minus i n2 over n1 sine of k1 d times e2 over e0. And here I divided by e0 on purpose, of course, because this is the definition of the reflection and transmission amplitudes. And this is n naughts minus n naught e zero over e zero. Let's see minus i n one sine of k one d plus n two cosine of k one d e two over e naught. Okay, so this now is the transmission amplitude, T, of the system, right? It's how big an amplitude do I get in medium two, given that I insert a field with this amplitude in medium zero, okay? And this is the reflection amplitude, R. And those are the ones I want to find. I don't really care about how big is E2 and E0. What I care about is the fraction between them. So if I shine an amount of light on a surface, how much gets reflected and how much gets transmitted without knowing the exact fields, just the percentages. Now, we can write this on a matrix form, of course, as you can in any linear equation system. And this will give us 1 n naught uh, plus 1 or minus n naught r is equal to m 1 and 2 t, where m is this uh, matrix here, which is uh, cosine k1 
k1d minus i over n1 sine of k1d and then minus i n1 sine of the same kd and cosine k1d like that okay and this m is the transfer matrix of a single film Okay. Now, this was a lot of fuss about nothing if we only cared about a single film. But what if we had a stack of films? Let's say I have 10 films for good measure. Well, then I could have the same structure, except now I would need one matrix per film and then just multiply those together and I would get an equation system on the exact same form. So, so if I have some structure here, incident light on this side, and I have, let's say, film one, film two, film three, and then film n at the end, and then some transmitted wave going out, then I can write my equation system as 1 and not plus 1, let's see, sorry, 1 over minus n not r equals m1. That's the transfer matrix for the first film, m2, and so on, up to mn, applied to 1 over nt times t. And uh, I want you to really carefully have a look at this because um, in the transfer matrix technique, people usually switch order on the matrices for some mysterious reason. They always get it wrong. So uh, look carefully now. Uh, okay, I have some, I'll show later that this is the electric and magnetic field here. Okay, because uh, as we remember, E was proportional to N times no, sorry, h was proportional to n times e, right? And this is the fraction between from one e to another, so I can just multiply by a, by the denominator. So, okay, just think of this is e and h here. Now, if I want e and h not at this interface, but at the next one, well, then I multiply by the matrix of that that transfer, so to speak. So, then I multiply by m n to get from here to here, and so on and so on, meaning that finally I have the field here, and then I multiply by m2, and then I multiply by m1, okay? So you have your vector at some point, and then you multiply by the matrices transferring it all along. It's very common to get confused about this and start multiplying matrices from the left instead starting m1 to the right here. And um, sometimes you go the other way. You start with some physical quantity here and you want to know it, then what the physical quantity is here and then here and then here. And then you multiply in the other order. So be careful when you set up the matrices. Otherwise, you, your answer will be completely screwed up. OK. So now, if I want to calculate a whole stack, well, then I just multiply the matrices and call the result m, or perhaps m total, and you proceed in the standard way. And m total, well, that's also a 2 by 2 matrix, which is going to have four coefficients, so let's call them a, b, c, d, like that. And then we can find r and t in terms of those coefficients, and this is pretty basic algebra, so I won't, 
I won't spend time on it. I'll just quote the result. And R is equal to A and naught plus B and naught and T minus C minus D and T over A and naught plus B and naught and T plus C plus D and T, where I call NT, that's the index of refraction in the substrate. Because now I don't know how many films I have, so I won't number it. Uh, also, the transmission amplitude is equal to 2 and naught, and then the same denominator as above. So, um, exactly how you get from here to there, that's just solving a linear equation system. But the idea here is important, okay? So if I want to solve for a really complex system of films, I just multiply matrix, matrices one per film. I get some result on this form. And then I just, I can in general solve for uh, what R and T are in terms of these A, B, C, and D. Okay, so just by doing that matrix multiplication, I can immediately say what the answer is. And I don't have to deal anymore with these huge analytical expressions. Right? Um, and this is a very useful tool now because uh, if you want to, do, to create, for example, um, a coating with very high reflectivity, so let's say I shine some light here on a stack of films and I want 100% going out, then it's easy for me to try out a lot of different combinations of field thicknesses, field uh, film uh, refractive indices, and so on to try different combinations. You can do that very quickly on a computer and then you can design a coating which has either a very high reflectivity or, trans or transmission. So um, common uh, glasses usually have some sort of anti-reflective coating. This is usually a thin film or a stack of thin films like this. Uh, if you buy an expensive camera, then there's always a, an anti-reflection anti coating on the, on the lenses. Same with binoculars. Um, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope has some sort of anti-transmission uh, anti coating, so to speak, or a high reflectivity coating. So depending on your technological application, you can um, um, create films that have um, many interesting uh, properties, either in terms of reflectivity or, transmi or uh, transmission. So I suggest that you look at the lecture notes for a, a detailed discussion of how you can do it, and also some examples of um, some example designs. But uh, first of all, let's clarify a bit what is the physics of this transfer matrix. Okay, so we recall that in our previous expression we had 1 and n, and r and t and so on. But since r is equal to e naught prime over e naught, and um, since uh, h is equal to 1 over set naught, n e, if I just look at the amplitude for now, then I can take the lower equation and multiply by, well, I can take both equations and multiply by E0. And the lower equation I can multiply by 1 over set naught. And that will give me a system on the following form. So if I have E naught, H naught, this is the incoming field. And then E naught prime, H naught prime. That's the reflected field. So this is, together, this is the total field in um, region 0. which was air, 
And this is equal to some matrix. Let's call it M prime because I had to modify it a bit to accommodate the set naught and so on. And then ET over HT. Sorry, there shouldn't be any. That's not a fraction. OK. So the transfer matrix, what is it? Well, it's something that takes the electric and magnetic fields at the back of all the films and translates it forward through the films all the way to the front. So if this is the matrix for the whole system, for all the films, it simply gives us the reflected and um, incoming fields in terms of the transmitted fields. OK? So it transfers a physical quantity at one point to a physical quantity at another point. That's the whole, whole idea of the transfer matrix technique. And if you encounter something called transfer matrices in a different context, well, uh, the formalism might look, might look different, and uh, it might be a bit confusing. But the idea is always the same, that you, uh, if you have some sort of linear relation between physical quantities at one point and another point, you can formulate it as a matrix multiplication. And then you can start to investigate really complex systems because you just keep multiplying matrices. Um, right. Yeah, and again, if you want to see non-normal incidents and some example applications like high reflectivity coatings, how you actually make them, you can uh, have a look in the in the compendium which I posted on the homepage. Uh, are there any questions to this thin film madness? Is it all easy? Okay. So. Um, do you want to start investigating wave guiding in a thin film, or do you want to do it on Monday? Well, we're through with most of the curriculum, so it's a bit up to you as well. I haven't received any requests from a repetition, a repetition from the class. OK, we'll just continue. So, wave guiding in dielectrics. Previously, we investigated wave guiding in uh, a hollow metallic waveguide, which gave us very easy dispersion relations and so on was quite tractable. But uh, let's now consider the following geometry, which is the one we already looked at. We have some substrate where we have an N2, which is uh, bigger than N0. And for simplicity, we'll just have that the top medium is air again. It doesn't really change much, but uh, Let's set it to that. Then we have some thin film. And this thin film will now need a reflective index, uh, sorry, a refractive index, which is N1, which is greater than N2, and N0. Okay? And the whole idea here is if you think in the geometric picture, you would have total internal reflection in this film. Okay? So there is some angle which is uh, large enough that you would have total reflection of the intensity inside this film. And that's the requirement to have a wave guiding. Okay? And to get that, you will need some uh, high refractive index material here. Uh, as an example, we could have uh, zirconium uh, dioxide with N equal to 2.15, I think, and um, uh, glass has n close to 1.5. Depends a bit on the glass type, but you definitely have types of glass with uh, 1.5 refractive index. Now you see that the refractive index is a lot bigger in the film, meaning that you can have some wave guiding effects occurring. Now if we, uh, let's see, if we recall that I defined k, the incoming vector, as a k parallel, 
and uh, component k3, which I wrote explicitly as a function, alpha of um, k parallel omega. Um, this was using the dispersion relation, so alpha of k parallel omega is equal to, in general, epsilon r of omega mu r of omega omega square over c square minus k parallel square. Now if, um, if k parallel was larger than this factor here, well then alpha is purely imaginary and we have what you call evanescent waves. So that's, that's what I have. I have some wave that is evanescent in air, but it's propagating inside the film. And we sketch this in the dispersion diagram. So if I have omega on the abscissa, on the ordinate, and uh, k parallel on the abscissa, then I have the light line in air, like this, schematically. That's where uh, k parallel is equal to omega over c. So that the light is just grazing the, grazing the surface. The whole wave vector is simply lying along the surface. There's also a light line for glass, which should be something like this. Should be a bit lower than that of um, air because this factor is larger than before. And finally, the thin film should be even lower. Now, the, if I have if I'm going to have a propagating mode in the film, it has to be to the right of the light, to the, sorry, to the left of the light line, right? Because k parallel has to be less than this factor. But if it shouldn't be propagating in the glass, it has to be to, on the right hand side of the glass light line, meaning that this is the part of the dispersion diagram which supports propagating modes. And as we'll see, not all modes inside this area are allowed, but um, if there are any propagating modes, they have to be inside this region. So if I have some uh, guided modes, they should be in here. So let's try to find those modes. Yep. Uh, where do you get the, the expression for the alpha? If you, let's see, uh, where did I get that? So k vector, that's an incoming, um, that's the incoming wave, right, from the air. That's the original idea. And now I define k parallel as the component of k, which is parallel to the interface. OK, we're good? Yeah. And then the third component, that's the uh, not, not parallel part, right, the orthogonal part. And if I recall that k parallel square plus uh, k3 square, that's equal to k square. That should be equal to, in air, omega square over c square. And if there's some dielectric medium, there should be a, an index of refraction here, n uh, square. Okay, so in air, this is simply one. Or in vacuum, it's one. While in our materials, this is some number between, let's say, one and three. Okay? And now I solve this one for k3, because then I explicitly incorporated the dispersion relation, because this is the dispersion relation for a plane wave, right? Now I can explicitly incorporate the, the dispersion relation in my solution. We recall that we have the solution, which was e to i k parallel r plus alpha or minus alpha, depending on whether the wave went up or down. So, this is more general because it allows for the fact that alpha can be purely imaginary or even in general complex, right? Because k parallel could, let's say, conceivably be larger than this factor. And then I would have to change the order and put an i on the outside, right? Because the square root of minus 1 is i. So this is a generalization of the geometry where you have light coming in here to um, a more general case where the light can in fact be evanescent here. It can be uh, totally internally reflected, as you've heard about before, right? Did that explain it? So, so the, the idea of alpha is just a K3 component, but in the general case, K3 could be imaginary. 
So it doesn't, we don't really have an incoming wave here. There's no propagating wave at all in this medium. This gave us, uh, because of that i, you, get, you have, let's say, e to i alpha times x3, right? But if alpha is some sort of i gamma, let's say, well then i times i becomes minus 1, and you get some exponential decay in this direction. So there's no wave anymore in the air. This is the idea of the wave guiding that you have evanescent fields outside and propagating fields inside. Because if the fields were propagating outside, they would just scatter out and you wouldn't have anything left here after a while. OK, so um, we're going to study a wave then that propagates through the film, but not in air and not in glass. And those waves will have to reside in this part of the dispersion diagram. OK? Because this is exactly the line where this and this uh, term are equal, meaning that the wave changes nature when you cross this line from propagating to evanescent. So it's propagating in glass here, meaning that you can't have wave guiding here. You need to be to the right of the glass light line. OK. Um, now let's define some axes. If I have the x1 axis pointing up, the x2 axis pointing like this, then the film is lying uh, transverse to the x1 axis along, uh, let's see, in the x, x2, x3 plane. So uh, at x1 equal to 0, that's the bottom of the film. That's um, here. So that's this plane here. And the top of the film is at x1 equals d. So if I try to draw some sort of sketch of it. Uh, not very impressive, but you get the idea. So there's a film lying on top of the x2, x3 plane. And it has a thickness d. And it goes off to infinity in all directions, right? In uh, the whole x2, x3 plane. And now. Um, Let's assume that there's a wave propagating along x1, no, sorry, x3, in this film. And then I suggest an electric field and a magnetic field on the following form. That is E of R t is equal to E of x1, some sort of spatial factor. We can't uh, assume that we have simple plane waves anymore because we'll have to match the boundary conditions here and here. As always, the boundary conditions are important. And some uh, exponential factor, which looks like that of a plane wave. So beta is some sort of wave number. We're propagating along x3. And there's, as always, some uh, harmonic time independence, like that. And I make the same ansatz for the magnetic field. So the field is propagating along x3, but there's no, uh, because of the translation symmetry in the x2 direction, there's no x2 dependence everywhere. That sounds reasonable, right? So b of x1, e to i beta x3 minus omega t. Uh, OK, and beta we can write as nm times 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is the vacuum wavelength. And nm, that's the effective index of refraction. for mode m. OK, so uh, we're going to see that this is, in fact, going to be different for each of the propagating modes. So don't worry too much about where that comes from. We'll see that eventually. I'm just, just preparing you. Now, uh, if you look at these expressions for the fields, you'll note that we can make the following simplifications, that in the wave equation, d2 is 0 because uh, there's no x2 dependence anywhere, so that isn't going to give us anything. 
dt is simply uh, minus i omega because of the exponential uh, here. And finally, that d3 is equal to i beta. And this um, simplifies the wave equations somewhat. Um, yeah. So I'm going to prove one point, and then we can leave. And the point is easily proven by regarding the curl equations, that is uh, the Faraday's law. And the um, Ampere's law. And if I write this out on component form, that's a lot of work, but then we can really reap the benefits of these simplified derivatives. We get the following equations, which are number three and four. So we have three equations that look like d3e2 is equal to dt b1 and d1e2 is equal to minus dt b3 and d3b1 minus d1b3 is equal to n square over c square dt square. No, that's not a square. E2. We have three more equations. D3, B2 is equal to minus n square over c square dt E1, D3, E1 minus D1, E3 is equal to minus dt b2 and finally d1 b2 is equal to n square over c square dt e3. Now why on earth did I start on this <laughs> start on this quest? Well you'll notice one thing I took away all the d2 terms and d3 is easy and dt is easy. Note also that these three equations contain only the components E2 and B3 and B1. Okay, so these are uh, coupled equations for these three components. Now, for these equations, we notice that we only have the second magnetic field component but we have the first and the third E field components. This means that these equations decouple. Okay, so these are coupled to each other, but they're not coupled to these three guys. Okay? And uh, so if you look at my answers for the fields, the the wave is propagating in the x3 direction. So for the equation three fields, we have only a second component here, meaning that the electric field is purely transverse. So we call this a transverse electric mode. TE or transverse electric. Notice that the B field is in fact, has in fact a component parallel to the direction of propagation. So <coughs> the B field has a component B3, which actually points in the same direction as the propagation direction, which is completely different from what we had in the vacuum, but this is a result from the confinement, the geometric confinement inside the film. This, however, does have an electric field parallel to the direction of propagation, <coughs> but a magnetic field that's um, uh, purely perpendicular to the direction of motion. So this is called a transverse magnetic mode. So it's transverse magnetic. 
Okay, and uh, on Monday we're going to try to find out some of the properties of these modes, which is a bit more tricky than a simple hollow metallic waveguide, but uh, all the more interesting. So I'll see you on Monday.